Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It is my pleasure to welcome George Taylor, the founder of Applied Climate Services, LLC in Corvallis, Oregon. He's going to explain to us why it's essential to understand the two basic types of climate scientists, the modelers and the empiricists, and how they think, how they work, and how climate science today is directly impacted by these two camps, if you will, of climatologists. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome George Taylor, who's been a meteorologist since 1971 to its rainmaking time. Welcome to its rainmaking time. Thank you, Kim. Nice to be here. Explain these two separate camps of operating and thinking and explain to us why this has an impact on climate science as we know it today. Well, let me start by saying that what I'm going to describe is a generalization, and uh, not everybody fits neatly into these categories. It's sort of like saying there are liberals and, and conservatives, when in reality people have different combinations of, of characteristics. But as I see it, the, the, the two main kinds of climate scientists and, and describing the kind of work they do are those who are the data people or the empirical people and, and the modelers. Uh, the, the modelers use uh, rather sophisticated numerical models, very similar to the ones that are used to predict day-to-day -day weather, and they, um, they, they, they try to simulate the, the atmosphere and, well, actually not just the atmosphere, but, but the, the Earth's processes. Uh, actually, in order to simulate climate or weather, you have to not only include the atmosphere, you have to include the, the oceans and other aspects of water, you have to include the what we call the cryosphere, which would be the the frozen sections, and the biosphere because because uh, plants and animals certainly affect uh, climate as well. Once the simulation is set up, then what the modelers do is they'll adjust or, or tweak certain parameters, and the one that's most often tweaked is is uh, changes in greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide. Um, all else being equal, if you if you increase the carbon dioxide, you're going to increase the temperature by some amount. And these simulation models tend to show uh, rather high amounts for for future changes in those greenhouse gases. And, and therefore, those who are are dependent on the models for analyzing the the present and predicting the future tend to tend to feel that uh, that there there will be global warming if CO2 goes up, which is likely to do. Now, the other camp of people are the data people or the empirical people who look at actual real-world data, and they try to determine cause and effect relationships between certain parameters like ocean conditions and, and uh, changes in sunlight and climate. Most of the state climatologists are data people. I'm a former state climatologist for Oregon and, and uh, am, am very familiar with that kind of uh, process and, and that kind of analysis. And most of the people that just look at the data are a lot less alarmed about future climate and future warming than those who are modelers. How do these two camps of processing information impact what we're receiving as being the declaration of global warming, which is now packaged as climate change, how does it affect what we're even referring to? I, th I think to answer that, I would, I would have to, to dip into the, uh, the political bag because one of the things that's happened in climate scientists, like climate science is it's gotten very much enmeshed with politics. And whenever science and politics mix, you... You, um, you you tend to have politics uh, slopping over into the decision making that's involved in science. Uh, science is, has a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of a lot of gray. There are a lot of unknowns, and if you study the history of science, you find a lot of a lot of cases, a lot of uh, a lot of subjects where science was pretty firmly believing a certain thing that later on proved to be untrue. Um, and, and that's part of the part of the uncertainty of the gray area in science is to acknowledge that there's a lot that we don't know and we don't understand. Um, being a, especially a, a climate and weather guy humbles me because weather and climate guys are wrong quite a bit of the time. And um, 
and, and that's true in just about every science. Politics, however, needs black and white yes-no answers to, to questions. And, and I think when, when scientists get trapped in this yes-no, black and white kind of world, um, they, um, they, they tend to get rather, rather exclusive and rather stubborn, and they forget about the uncertainties. Uh, this, this whole field of climate science has gotten so enmeshed in politics that it has uh, carried over into some um, real polarization. You, you, you tend to have science, scientists on one side or the other of this, of this uh, global climate issue rather than us all uh, talking about the uncertainties and agreeing to get along. When the public perceives, when climatologists say this or that, how is it possible that the final word on climate is the official word? If, in fact, there's two totally different camps in which, or paradigms in which they each come to analyze data. One is through simulation. And, of course, I did a piece on this regarding simulation, which is garbage in, garbage out. It depends what's put into the simulation generates what you get out. So unless the public knows what is being put into simulations, it's hard to just blindly agree that the official stated condition of concern is this warming, since we've had record temperatures of cooling in the last 10 years. Do you understand that? Um, I, I understand that. I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer really is. I mean, one of, the, one of the questions that I get a lot when I give public talks, and I give a lot of public talks, is... Well, you say this, and somebody else says this. How do I know who to believe? And it's and it's tough to know who to believe. Uh, why should why should they listen to George Taylor instead of uh, James Hansen? Why should they listen to James Hansen instead of George Taylor? And James Hansen is a uh, is a fellow from NASA who believes differently about the human component than I do. Um, it's 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 a tough thing to know. And and I think uh, again with the, with the uh, um, the, the the political pressure. I think scientists are are less willing to admit that they have reservations or uncertainties about this issue, rather than just saying, you know, this is this is what I feel, and uh, and and I might be wrong, and uh, and and, and th- these are the reasons why I might be wrong. There, there's a famous physicist. He was a Nobel Prize winner, Richard Feynman, and uh, and he once said, the the finest scientists are always trying to prove themselves wrong. And I think it's it's human nature to do just the opposite, and I recognize that in myself. I I really try to justify my own my own decisions, my own opinions, my own wisdom and knowledge. And I think uh, it's it's easy to get caught up in that, and uh, probably a big mistake. How come it is that science appears as if it's been co-opted, and that you have this huge peer pressure to agree that humans are the cause? of a condition called climate change, when climate change has been distorted as a concept, is something that scientists always agreed is something that goes on over long periods of time. But now all of a sudden, we're connected to being the cause of something that's a natural cyclical phenomenon, A, and B, the Earth's been cooling for 10 years, and yet I watch Bindi Irwin, who's been asked questions about global warming, and I love Bindi, and I loved her father and her mother and the work that they do, but it's almost like global warming has been thrown into this big package. If you love the Earth, then everything global warming that's wrong with the Earth, you get involved in global warming. Instead of its own distinct niche of dialogue, it's the soup for everything. Do you see that? I, I do see that, and 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 what I see also is is some real um, well. Part of this polarization, I guess, is is uh, distrust on on both sides of the issues, distrust of one side for the other. And I've certainly been the target of a, what you might call witch hunts, and certainly a lot of lot of criticism for my uh, skepticism about the the human component of, uh, of, of climate change. I've, I've been skeptical about this for a long time, since the mid-1990s. And What does that mean when you say that? I want to take you back for just a minute. What does that mean when you say, I've had a long history of being skeptical about the human side? Explain it. Okay. There, there are people that believe that humans domi- human activities dominate the climate system, that, that quite a bit of the climate change that we see is the result of human activities, notably greenhouse gas changes and and i i don't feel that that's true i think 
I think uh, climate variation is dominated by natural factors like sunlight, uh, ocean conditions, and, and so on. Um, and and so I am I am skeptical about the idea that humans dominate the climate system, and that if we can control our emissions, then we will somehow control climate. And that's a, a viewpoint that that certainly Al Gore has espoused, and uh, and, and and quite a few scientists. James Hansen, I mentioned earlier, the the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, believes that humans have a profound influence on climate, and. The answer to that is really we need to control emissions in order to control climate. And I don't think we can control climate. But isn't that humanity's greatest failing, the desperate desire and need to control all of life? Isn't that really the anathema to discovery, prosperity, is this need to control? And now it's at this highly matrixed level. I think that's a that's a correct statement. I, I think we um, we get kind of full of ourselves and think you know somehow we're 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 bigger than we are and more important than we are. And if we just fix this, then it'll fix everything else. And then every now and then a a volcano or an earthquake or a tsunami reminds us that we're um, we're pretty tiny on this uh, r- rather significant planet. And on the one hand. Um, there, there's a lot to be said for, 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 for keeping our planet as clean as we can keep it. Um, and then on the other hand, I think there's a balance between uh, things like um, prosperity and uh, human survival on the one hand and, uh, and control of emissions on the other. We have a finite amount of money uh, that we can spend on environmental problems. And uh, I'm going to put on my citizen's hat rather than the scientist hat and say I, I think that uh, if 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 I were deciding where the money would go, I would put it into clean water and um, vaccinations for children in third world countries and 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 those kinds of, of immediate needs that I think would would give us a lot more bang for the buck than than trying to control carbon dioxide. In your expertise and learning as a meteorologist and climatologist. Have you learned that carbon is a toxin? Do you agree with that, that the EPA is now declaring carbon a toxin? Uh, absolutely, I disagree with that. In fact, carbon dioxide is uh, it, it's really a fertilizer. It's one of the three essential nutrients or uh, growing, growing mechanisms that plants need. They, need. they need water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide. And... Uh, Ironically, we, we talk about controlling CO2, and yet uh, increases in CO2 uh, cause, uh, cause greater health to plants, uh, greater drought tolerance, and, and a lot of other benefits. So in, in many ways, uh, by, by releasing more CO2, uh, we're, we're releasing a, a aerial fertilizer into the environment. Um, so as long as CO2 is not a, um, a, a significant problem in terms of climate, um, then, then releasing it should should not only have a benign effect; it should actually have a beneficial effect. Um, and and so it, it comes down to the, the climate issue. And I'm convinced, after studying this for a long time, that changes in CO2 exert only a, a minor influence on climate change. How is it so many climatologists and meteorologists are aligning with the declaration that CO2 is a toxin? Why? Now, I want you to know something. In the last 25 years, I accepted the information that was told to me through the media that carbon dioxide is bad for you. I want you to know I ingested that. So I've always believed that because that's what I was told, quote, by the authorities. But only when I went in to do my own personal examination into this did I find out how turned upside down the truth really is, and that this is just not so. That's exactly what happened to me, Kim. I was, uh, in the first part of my career, lived in Southern California and uh, was an air quality meteorologist. I moved to Oregon in 1989, uh, became the the state climatologist for Oregon, and, and, and really began studying climate systematically for the first time. Uh, and, and I believed what a lot of people were saying, and that was that uh, CO2 is increasing and therefore things are going to get warmer. Uh, 
and and they were saying it by by a lot. And so I believe people who were saying that and certainly made some public statements to that effect. I began really studying this issue in about 1993 or 94. And by 1995, I was convinced that that viewpoint was wrong and that uh, that CO2's effect was was uh, was minimal and rather benign. Um, I, I began to espouse that opinion in about 1996 or 97, and immediately was um, set upon by colleagues who attacked me <laughs> openly for having that viewpoint. I, I began to see the incredible. Uh, emotions and, uh, and and belief system surrounding this, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was rather shocking to hear people criticize me and make very very personal, condemning statements about me based on my viewpoint on this one issue. It it is a hot emotional issue and has been for a long time, and in fact, most environmental issues tend to be that way. It was that way with the, uh, the 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 whole issue of ozone depletion, which is another, to me, red herring. It was that way with acid rain, which was another red herring and has been proven to be that way. And and I think again and again we see these issues that come up and they become very emotional. But uh, it makes me really wonder uh, where those belief systems come from and 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 why they're such why are they become such hot issues. I have an interesting little tidbit for you. I had written on the Huffington Post something about CO2 when I first learned that it's not a toxin. And um, someone had written me and said, well, if you went in an airplane and you had point blah, blah, whatever, how I don't even remember how much they said of, of carbon dioxide, you would be asleep and you could die. So how would you like that all over the earth? I didn't even know how to respond to that because I think that in order to see clearly, you have to be willing to become a student again and to keep learning. And I think that's part of the key before we all blindly believe what we're being told just because we want to believe the authorities, quote, I really think we need to do our own thinking on this. For example, the whole issue of simulations is the basis of the paradigm the IPCC uses to generate the declaration that the earth is warming. Nobody asks, where did you get that information? Well, from simulations. Yeah. And that simulations aren't real world data because if real world data was involved, we'd know that the earth has been cooling for 10 years. (laughs) So the other thing is that I've always been an environmental advocate. I don't know what that means. What does that mean? I love the earth. I want to preserve the earth. I want to take care of the earth. I love plants. I love animals. I love people. I love lakes. I love all wildlife. But unfortunately, if you're connected that way, there's now this perception and this mindset that's been created that if you're truly an environmentalist, if you're a person that cares about the environment, You are to align with the global warming declaration, quote, state of emergency, and all interest to roll up our sleeves and learn the facts of real world data and what's been going on and the distinctions between climate and weather. That's what needs to happen. But it's not going to happen if we close our eyes and just say, well, I'm an environmentalist, so I got to believe everybody because that's what I did. I didn't even analyze an inconvenient truth. I accepted everything that was in there and I didn't have the mindset and the mindfulness to ask the questions that are now part of a frame of reference for looking at this subject. But I have a question with you. What happened to you and why are you being targeted? Um, what happened to me is I, I, I read a book in uh, in about 1994 called Sound and Fury written by Pat Michaels. Pat Michaels at that time was the state climatologist for uh, for Virginia. And so he was my counterpart in Virginia, and I knew Pat. And I read that book, and it had a very different viewpoint on this whole issue and a different way of looking at it. And again, it was it was a, a data-based approach, an empirical kind of thing. And 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 it was um, it was an innovative and kind of kind of fresh look at at the subject and and the way of analyzing it. And I um, began looking at, at data in the Northwest and uh, the rest of the West Coast and other places and. Using using Pat's approach and and became convinced that that, that Pat was right. Um, 
What was Pat's premise? Pat's premise was that, uh, that, that the effects of changing CO2 on climate uh, would, be, um, would be manageable and benign that, that the, the influence of changes in greenhouse gases would be minimal. We might not even be able to measure it. And, uh, and it, was, it was really a, um, he didn't really say it was a waste of time and money, but, but certainly implied that, that the, the, the effects of significant CO2 control would be, uh, would be rather insignificant in the climate system because he felt that that the, the CO2 did not exert a very strong influence on climate, um, and uh, and and that climate change varied mostly because of of other kinds of natural changes. And it, as as I analyzed the data over a couple of years, it it made a lot of sense to me, and and began to really coalesce into a new way of of looking at the world. And um, and yet it was a way that, that, that many people disagreed with. And again, it's this, this emotional thing that people get very altruistic. They, they, they come up with certain belief systems. And if you say anything that would violate those, they, they get very upset. And that's the only way I can describe what happened to me was that uh, I, was, I was set upon by, by colleagues and other people because by, by not agreeing with this whole thing, this notion that CO2 is wrong, then I was somehow a bad guy. I think ultimately it's it, it's really about about control. And if you uh, to to control CO2, you're really controlling how we how we use energy. And if you control energy, you control life. So ultimately, I think a lot of it is about control and uh, and and control by government of of individuals. And so uh, being one who um, doesn't always trust the, the workings of government. It makes me uh, a bit suspicious. I think it's pretty interesting to look at the language that's now been established regarding this whole thing, a carbon footprint, a carbon trading system, the involvement of J.P. Morgan's architect for derivatives, who's part of the carbon trading system. It's disconcerting how everybody's villainized who dares to question or look at any of this. My question to you is, on a scientific level, how much CO2 do you think is released when a volcano erupts? I've, I've seen various figures, and I guess the, the bottom line is a lot. Compared to, compared to human emissions, probably on, on an annual basis, probably not that much. I've, I've seen figures for the Iceland volcano that suggested that this was you know, years worth of, of emissions from humans. And I, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, but, but, but certainly volcanoes have a strong influence on climate, probably not so much from the, from the CO2 standpoint as they are from just, just the amount of dust in the atmosphere tends to block sunlight. And it's especially true with, with tropical volcanoes, such as Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in the early 90s, uh, El Chichon in Mexico in the early 80s, and then way back, uh, Tambora in the early 1800s and Krakatoa in 1883 were, were huge volcanic eruptions with a lot of dust in the atmosphere, and they caused a global cooling that lasted for some time. So, so certainly volcanoes have a significant influence on climate, uh, mostly a cooling influence. When you refer to human emissions, what does that mean? Carbon dioxide is a product of combustion, and uh, for pretty much any kind of combustion of a carbon-containing material. Now, that can be uh, burning wood, um, it can be uh, gasoline, coal, um, natural gas, any of the hydrocarbons when they're combusted. One of the byproducts is carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide has been going up for well, really throughout the, the Industrial Revolution, the 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 pre-industrial revolution amount of CO2 in the atmosphere was uh, 250 or so parts per million. Um, that's 0.02% uh, of of the atmosphere by volume. Um, right now, it's at about 390 parts per million. So there's 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 been an increase. And at the same time, temperatures have gone up. So people say, well, see, CO2 went up and temperatures went up and that's that. Al Gore says that all the time. Um, 
the, the, the problem is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution occurred at a time known as the Little Ice Age, which was a lot colder globally than it is now. Glaciers were down in valleys, and, and uh, there were a lot of crop failures because uh, colder temperatures tend to be rather detrimental to agriculture. So, so there were, there were, that was just a cool time. And if, you, and if you start a trend at a cool time and end it at a warmer time like we're seeing now, then, then you're going to see an increase. And so people say, well, CO2 went up and temperatures went up. But if you go back a thousand years, you, you come to a period that's usually known as the medieval warming or the climate optimum of the Middle Ages that occurred uh, centered around 1000 AD with a couple hundred years before and after. It was a time that was comparable to today in terms of temperatures and uh, crops really, really flourished. Civilization was very happy. Greenland was settled and there was agriculture in Greenland and CO2 was a lot lower than it is today. So whatever caused the warming a thousand years ago, it wasn't CO2. And I think whatever caused the warming now, it's mostly not CO2 either. I have another question for you. Why is it, if you go to iceagenow.com, he tracks how the earth has been cooling. It's a huge clearing house of information of what's going on in terms of climate all over the world for a long, long time. How come it is that the earth, from a data perspective, is cooling for the last 10 years, but most of the conversation is about how it's warming? I don't get it. I don't get it either, Kim, and and I... I know that, that, that NASA and maybe the National Climatic Center have declared that 2010 may be the warmest year ever. Of course, we're <laughs> not even halfway into 2010, so it's a little bit early to declare that. But um, there, there, there's so many issues involving how you take the temperature of the Earth. And I, and I think, frankly, to, um, to take a single value for the temperature of the Earth with all its variety is, is a big mistake. I, I just don't think we can do it in any kind of a decent manner. I think we have to look at individual locations and then somehow come up with a with a with a better way of, of identifying this. But um, there there are a lot of people that believe that we are moving into a, a cooler period. They've already moved into a cooler period, and I'm one of them. We're we're seeing uh, unexpected reduction in uh, radiation from the sun, fewer sunspots. Uh, the solar physicists are kind of scratching their heads, wondering why the sun is so inactive now. But I, I think that's one of the factors that will that will influence uh, temperatures over the next 20 or 30 years, and I think they will continue to be on the cool side. The other the other factor that I think is is huge is the tropical Pacific. The the tropical Pacific from South America on the east to the Indonesia on the west, let's say 10 to 15 degrees north or south of the equator dominates world climate. The, this is an area called the Pacific Warm Pool, and it is the largest source of heat to the atmosphere of any place on Earth, and changes in the tropical Pacific literally affect every part of the world. And in a nutshell, when we get an El Nino event, uh, we, we tend to see warming, global warming, uh, and when we get a La Nina event, we tend to see global cooling. Now, over the course of time, El Nino and La Nina events happen about uh, as often as each other, about each, each one about the, the same frequency, but they tend to be bunched up into periods of about 25 years, where you'll get maybe a 25-year period with mostly El Nino events, and, and then uh, 25 or so year periods with mostly La Ninas. If we look at the 20th century, there were, there were four pretty distinct periods. The, the first, say, 1900 to about 1920 was mostly La Nina periods, and the temperatures were rather cool. From the, from the 20s to the mid-40s, we were in a mostly El Nino period, and that was a very warm period. In the U.S., it was the, the warmest period that we've seen in the last 100 years. And I think it was because of all these El Ninos. From the, from the mid-40s to the early 70s, we were back in a mostly La Nina period, and temperatures were much cooler. From the uh, mid-70s to the late 90s, we were in an El Nino-dominated period, and that was really the, 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 the global warming scare began during that period. And, and I think that beginning in the late 90s or around 2000, we move back into a period that it will end up being a La Nina-dominated period, and that's a big reason why 
temperatures have cooled over the last 10 years. I have a question about the solar cycle. I really want to talk about it for a moment. Okay. Why is the solar cycle activity missing from analysis and focus in the official climatology propaganda? Why is it missing from the rhetoric and discussion? How can the sun and its activity, which impacts what's happening on Earth, not be a factor in looking at what's going on? I think the sun is a huge factor because it is our main energy source. But I think the, the problem is we, we don't really understand it well enough to be able to predict what's going to happen. What we do know is that the sun has a lot of different cyclical or cycle components. Um, one really obvious one that we probably understand the best is the sunspot cycle, which lasts about 11 years. And it's almost like clockwork. Uh, it varies a little bit in length, but it's pretty much 11 years. But the, the, the amplitude or the number of sunspots varies from one cycle to the next. Now, generally speaking, the more sunspots, the stronger the radiation and the, and the warmer the Earth tends to be. And certainly the, the 20th century, especially the latter part of the 20th century, was, was characterized by pretty active sunspots, uh, active solar cycle, and, and that did coincide with the warming, and I don't think that was a coincidence. Colder periods in the past, like the one around 1800, were periods with very few sunspots, and so there, there, there tends to be a cause and effect relationship. But there are other cycles that we see. There's, there's one that's uh, 20 to 25 years long that's, that's a, a cycle in the sun's magnetic field. There appears to be about a 45-year cycle and a 90-year cycle and a 210-year cycle and a 1,500-year cycle. And, and, and the more we study this, the more we're discovering that there are actually a lot of different cycles in the, in the sun's behavior and in the Earth's uh, place in the solar system, the, the tilt of the Earth's axis and, and the, uh, the, the circularness of the Earth's orbit, if you will, uh, those are factors as well, but we, we don't really understand those well enough to be able to predict what they're going to do, and therefore we just leave them out of the equation, even though it's, it's hard to imagine that they're not strong influences. We, we ignore them or neglect them from our predictions because we don't really understand them and we don't know how to predict them, and therefore, since we're leaving out some important variables, the, the influence of the variables we are looking at, like CO2, tend to be amplified and really really magnified quite a bit. It's interesting, as you talk about the two different camps of climatology focus, it's clear to me now why the solar cycle is left out of the equation of the IPCC, how it's not part of the factoring of climate. Yet, because, you know, you can't predict. So from a simulation point of view, it's not worth involving it, right? Right. You can't play with it. But from a real-world data point of view, we know that the sun has cycles too. And those cycles correlate to cooling and warming on Earth. So how could it be ignored is beyond me. But I know it's critical, and it's more critical than most of the public and environmentalists really understand. And I have another question for you, which is, if you had $2 billion dollars, and you had an opportunity to educate the public on what they need to know in order to discern for their own self the skinny on climate, what would you do? You have $2 billion, and you don't have to worry about getting grants from people that are going to obstruct your ability to speak truthfully. You know, I've never been asked that question before, so I... I uh, I, I kind of draw a blank. When you when you mentioned the money, I thought, you know, if I had $2 billion, one of the things I would do would be to invest in in uh, in, in treating uh, mosquito nets with DDT to, uh, to uh, relieve some of the suffering from malaria that goes on in third world countries, because it's, a, to me, a, a, a travesty and something that could be, could be prevented. Um, and, and clean water is another thing that I am adamant about. And and, and and my heart goes out to people in places that don't have clean water. We we get pretty spoiled here in the U.S. because we things things are pretty good, and in in a lot of other places they aren't. If it if it came down to um, to publicity, I th I think I would 
um, I would I would try to do the the kind of thing maybe that Al Gore did with the inconvenient truth, but 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 show the the other side of the story, um, and and present it in a way that intelligent lay people could could view that and and make up their own minds. Uh, Richard Linson, who's been a climate skeptic, one like me who who believes that. Humans, human influences have a small effect on climate. is a is a professor at MIT in atmospheric sciences, and and his um, his viewpoint, and he stated this, really parallels my own. He said he said when I when I give a, a talk to just kind of ordinary folks, you know, intelligent lay people, they they tend to agree with me on this issue. It's the it's the really smart people that tend to disagree. He said if I if I try to talk to my colleagues at MIT about this, they they tend to disagree with me, but he said just the the, the ordinary people and not the overeducated people seem seem to get this pretty well, and and that's been my experience as well. People will say to me when I give a public talk, you know, I um, I, I think this is great, but I've never heard this before. Why well, haven't I heard this before? But it makes sense to me, and I, and I think it is sensible. And maybe the the, the people on my side have have uh, have not spent enough time getting the message out, but. I, I think when when you present uh, the the argument with, uh, with with simple facts, it becomes pretty clear that uh, the the human influence is relatively small. At least in my mind, it does. And I, I think we could we could do a better job of, of of getting that that notion out there in the in the media and in the schools. Part of the complexity of speaking out about this is that one is immediately put into this anti environment gestalt, which isn't true. But there's a psychology and a mindset that's now been prepared by the mainstream media that if you don't agree with the official story, propaganda, the declaration of this said condition, you're crazy, you're fringe, you're not reality-based, you're against the environment, you're a person who's into ecocide. I mean, the distortions are many. Well, are you in the employ of big oil? And I, and I have I have been accused of that. It was it was ironic in my in my years at uh, at Oregon State University being a, a, a bicycle rider. And for for many years, uh, I didn't have a car. My wife and I shared one, and she would drive it because she's a school teacher and needed the car. But I rode a bicycle every day, and and yet people would would accuse me of being in the employ of oil companies, and I never have been. They would accuse me of being anti-environment and. And yet, these were people that drove cars, and I didn't. And I almost hate to use this on your show, but but there were people that were calling me a fossil fuel whore, and and you know I questioned that, and they said, well, why else would you would you have this point of view except that the oil companies are paying you to say it? Um, you know, it's it's like if you have a certain opinion that, that differs from the rank and file, then, then then it means you're being paid off by somebody. And I I really resented that. It was it was very unfair and certainly untrue, and yet it it speaks to the very divisive nature of this issue and and the the emotions attached to it and the difficulty that people have in changing their mind about something that they believe passionately about. Well, I want you to know I have changed my whole mindset about this mostly by doing 15 shows on this and doing tons of groundwork on it and research and really putting the pieces together. Of, not just what is being said, but how everybody came to what they're saying. Understanding that there's simulators and then there's the real world data people. And once you understand the distinction, then you understand what's driving the conversation, what's driving the propaganda, what's driving mainstream media about this. The other thing that's very insidious and complex for the average person is when the average person sees celebrities politicians, leaders of countries start to get on the bandwagon of something that they themselves haven't done the homework to really look at. It's very disconcerting. And since many people are, how do you say, influenced by celebrity, you know, you have Richard Branson laughing in the face of anybody who disagrees with this. You have Sting. I saw an interview with Trudy and Sting, and I really love them. But I mean, he said he thinks people who don't accept this are crazy. Well, he'll have to confront his old tennis teacher. 
<laughs> I, used, I used to teach them tennis years ago, and I'm definitely not crazy. In fact, I've spent quite a bit of time with this. I'm an environmentalist, and I'm perfectly okay to see clearly with this, ask the questions, put the pieces together, and look. But it's very, very disconcerting to see this. And this is part of the dynamic of the peer pressure to go along and get along and not to stand outside of the dogma that's being imposed on people around the world. And the conversation that one can have regarding this subject is already preloaded architecturally with inferences, elements, you're not an environmentalist, you hate the environment, all those things like you being accused of being funded by big oil. This is all pre-loaded dialogue that seeps into the public mind whenever people go in, roll up their sleeves, look and start to see what's really there. I just really appreciate you sharing your story and coming on its rainmaking time. Talk a little bit about applied climate and what you're doing today. Sure. I uh, I retired from Oregon State University two years ago. Oh, three years ago. Let me back up a little bit. Three years ago, I was in a uh, more or less a debate with the, the fellow from Washington, who at that time was the Washington State climatologist. His name is Phil Mote. And, and we gave our viewpoints on, on climate. And, and Phil believes uh, and is a member of the IPCC, so he believes what the IPCC says, and that is that CO2 and other human activities are significantly influencing climate. And if we um, if we can control CO2, we can control climate. He believes that. And um, so we gave our, our viewpoints, and, and we're very respectful. We like each other. We uh, It was certainly not, not uh, ugly or anything, but it was, it was we, we, we have very different viewpoints, and we kind of agree to disagree. Well, the, the governor of my state, his name is Ted Kulingoski, got wind of this and immediately said, uh, George Taylor is not my climatologist, and I, I didn't appoint him, and I don't recognize him, and we really need to, to find somebody here who represents Oregon climate policy. Now, to my knowledge, Oregon didn't have a climate policy, but the governor did, and so he, he, uh, he felt that I was detrimental to that, and he, he backed away from that, and I didn't get fired, but over the next year, my, um, my bosses at Oregon State University were, let's just say, less than supportive, and and the whole the, the whole issue had been had been so divisive for so long, and I was so tired of it that I decided just to just to walk away from my job. So I retired early in 2008, started my own little company, Applied Climate Services, and I do stay involved in this climate change issue mostly through public talks that I give. But um, my my specialty is really extreme weather events, extreme precipitation for uh, things like like dam safety and and extreme stream flows, floods, and so on that I that I do for civil engineering purposes as well as uh, uh, work in 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 lawsuit situations and and then I I'm involved in other ways in in court cases as an expert witness on weather related. Um, uh, weather-related lawsuits and uh, and damage claims and so on. So it's I'm I'm not as closely tied in to, to climate day to day and uh, um, and you know in in many ways I'm I'm kind of glad to be away from from the hot seat. I'm certainly glad not to be a public servant anymore because now I can say whatever I want to say. I can be on your show and express my opinion exactly as it is without any caveats to say, my viewpoint does not represent the state of Oregon or Oregon State University, so um, you, know, you don't have to listen to what I say, which is kind of what I had to say before. Uh, now I can just say what I really believe and not worry about it. And I'm happy doing what I'm doing. George Taylor, I really want to thank you for being a guest on my show. It's rainmaking time. We really appreciate you coming here and helping educate the public on how to look at this whole world of climatology and explaining some distinctions within that for us. And I want to invite you back with others at a later date. And thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Kim. It was good talking to you today. It's rainmaking time.